microphone check. One, two, the microphone check. One, two, one, two, the microphone check. I got my headphones tuned between two different AM stations and my briefcase is full of declassified information. Declassified, uh huh, mm -hmm. declassified. Good evening and welcome to News from Neptune for the 30th week of 2011. For more than 20 years, this program has been a spontaneous and unrehearsed discussion of the news of the week and its coverage by the media. First on local radio, station WEFT, and when I was censored and excluded there, welcomed, I'm happy to say, by the good people at Urbana Public Television, which does in fact seem to be, I quote, an accessible, responsible, and responsive media outlet, close quote, which WEFT by its charter is supposed to be, but I'm sorry to say, is not. I'm Carl Estabrook. My discussants tonight are David Green and Ron Zoak. Our format will be to take turns introducing a topic or a comment or an outrage of the week. Uh, there's some good ones. Uh, and uh, the others will comment or ask questions about the topic we've raised, and we'll try to go around several times on that. Uh, our program's name, News from Neptune, was chosen to honor Noam Chomsky who has been talking since about American politics for more than twice as long as the program's been on the air. Chomsky has said that in the American media, I quote, either you repeat the same conventional doctrines everybody is saying, or else you say something true, and it will sound like it's from Neptune. So we'll try to say some true things tonight. It's Friday, July 29th, 2011. And on this date in 1932, in the midst of the Great Depression, uh, General Douglas MacArthur, uh, an American military figure with uh, cavalry and tanks, it must have been an interesting scene, I mean, horse-mounted horse, horse, uh, soldiers and tanks mixed together, it was 1932, uh, and his aides, uh, a Colonel George Patton and a Colonel Dwight David Eisenhower, drove a peace encampment, sort of like Terrier Square, out of Washington, D.C. Uh, the so-called Bonus Army, a group primarily of First World War veterans, had encamped in Washington uh, begging for relief uh, that they th and claimed was due them as veterans of the Great War uh, from the Congress. Uh, this had gone along merrily for a while, and then finally uh, the president, uh, who was Herbert Hoover, uh, decided that uh, these veterans were really making just too much of a mess in the Capitol and their demands were uh, uh, too outrageous and they had to be driven out. Uh, and they called the Washington police to do it. Uh, Washington police opened fire on the veterans. Uh, a couple of people were killed. Uh, and then the army was mobilized the next day on this day, July 29th, 1932, to drive the unarmed, of course, veterans out of Washington, D.C. Interesting to think about, particularly in regard to an attempt this fall uh, in Washington, D.C., to have another encampment, like the Bonus Army's encampment, about war and uh, depression. Uh, that's scheduled to begin on October 6th and to be open-ended until the government, in fact, um, responds with redress of grievances on uh, both economic and military matters, ends the war, and provides support for uh, uh, those Americans uh, who are without jobs. Uh, so we. What, what's past is prologue, they say. Maybe we'll have a, maybe the, the, today's events in 1932 was a rehearsal for the full. Uh, the military officers I mentioned a moment ago went on to uh, bigger, if not better, things, uh, all of them becoming, of course, heroes of the great, of the great, of the Second World War. Uh, and that may give the uh, administration a way of how to get out of their current problems. We don't know. Uh, there is another event in another town uh, the town Washington, the town of Washington was the one, the first one uh, was centered on. Uh, another event in another town on this day uh, seven years ago, would that be right? 2004, yes. Um, 400 demonstrators clashed with the Boston police in downtown Boston. Uh, the Black Tea Society, a little different perhaps, maybe not, from the tea partiers we've been hearing at recently. The Boston area Black Tea uh, tea Society, an ad hoc group of self-described anarchist and anti-authority activists, um, uh, began a demonstration in downtown Boston where they burnt uh, a two-faced effigy depicting President Bush on one side and Senator John Kerry on the other side. 
uh, hence the, you know, 2004, this is the summer before the election, uh, on the grounds that there was no appreciable difference uh, between the two leading candidates for president. Uh, so they burnt the effigy and they got into a shoving match with the Boston police, who liked that sort of thing. Um, and one of the Boston policemen uh, was recorded as complaining, and I quote, we've trained two years for this, and they showed us nothing. I should do that in a Boston accent, shouldn't I? <clears throat> uh, pack the can, have it yet. Uh, we trained two years for this, and they showed us nothing. I'm disappointed in the quality of the anarchists we've got here. <laughs> That's a quote. You know, the, the accent, hey, I've been away a long time. I'm not sure about the accent. But that is what he said. So, I'm ashamed at the quality of anarchists we got here. Uh, truer words were never spoken, it seems to me. And it's, you know, I hope uh, there will be no one around uh, in Washington to say uh, this fall, when the encampment begins there, that he's ashamed at the quality of anarchists we have. Uh, let's see if we can do better this time. Ah, so you're watching News from Neptune, uh, the town edition, and I'll explain that in a moment. We have two towns, Boston and Washington, are involved here, but uh, there's another connection I want to talk about. Uh, we, uh, we'll get to that before too long. Uh, but we'll start with uh, Ron Zoak, who gets the, uh, the first serve. Sure. Well, I will take up uh, one of those threads and talk about the ongoing melodrama in D.C. and uh, refer to some interesting graphs that have... Uh, been published in today's New York Times, how the U.S. got $14 trillion in debt and who are the creditors. I can't very well convey all of this information to you uh, verbally. I would suggest that you look at the graphs. Uh, uh, to whom is the money owed in the national debt? The public, about $3.6 trillion. China, uh, 1.2 trillion. That's a little different than what we've been led mm -hmm. to believe, actually. Mm -hmm. The Federal Reserve System, 1.6 trillion. The Social Security Trust, 2.7 trillion. Other government trust funds, 1.9 trillion, and so on. When the debt was accumulated, uh, before Reagan, 1.0 uh, trillion, 1981 and earlier. Under Reagan, 1981 to 89, 1.9 trillion. Under uh, George Bush, the first Bush, 1.5 trillion, 89 to 93, due to the first Gulf War and lower revenue from a recession. 1.4 trillion under Bill Clinton, despite two years of on budget surpluses, deficit spending in other years added to the debt. Under George W. Bush, 2001 to 2009, tax cuts, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, economic downturn in 2001 and recession starting in 2007, uh, gave rise to $6.1 trillion in additional uh, indebtedness. And under Obama, 2009 to 11, so far, $2.4 trillion due to stimulus spending, tax cuts, and the effects of the 2007 to 9 recession in lost revenues and automatic spending like unemployment compensation. So you might dispute the uh, relative allocation of the costs of the Middle East wars since Obama has chosen to extend and expand uh, those wars and we're not done there yet by uh, any means. Latest news up to the uh, minute uh, uh, breaking uh, developments in Washington, D.C., the official estimate when we would run out of money, or rather, not money, but borrowing authority, has been August 3rd. Some are now saying, with some uh, uh, jiggery pokery and uh, creative accounting, that can be delayed until August 10th, which is not a lot of breathing room, but uh, we'll see. How often has the debt limit been raised? Uh, dozens of times, it, apparently. I, uh, I'm not sure it would make sense to show you this graph, but it starts an exponential uh, rise, the number of times that, uh, the debt limit rather, uh, starting in about 1980. And uh, here it goes, whoop, up that way. Uh, the debt limit as a percentage of gross domestic product is now approaching 100%, but it's been uh, higher than that in the past. 
uh, maybe uh, half that uh, in the uh, early 1980s, but uh, during wartime it uh, peaks, of course. How bond rates could rise if the U.S. rating is lowered. The current bond rating of the USA is triple A, which is the highest one. And according to this, the highest ratings uh, are for Switzerland. So if you want to make certain that your bonds will pay their premiums, you buy Swiss bonds. Next is Hong Kong, then Sweden, Germany, and Canada. The United States comes in next, which is on watch for uh, going negative. Beyond that, the yields become uh, higher on the 10-year government uh, bond because of the lesser certainty. Uh, you, uh, they will have to pay a premium in order to uh, attract your money and get people to invest there. So it goes up after the United States from uh, uh, Denmark. The highest rates are from the countries that are considered negative risks, Belgium, New Zealand, Slovenia, Spain, and Italy and uh, their bond rates for the 10-year government bond range from 4.3% to 6%. The current rate given here for the USA is 3%. So uh, where's the money going and uh, why is it needed? Uh, with a uh, little uh, research, you can figure that out. Something from a editorial in the Nation uh, magazine. Republicans have once again shown themselves to be a party, to paraphrase Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz, of the 1%, by the 1%, and for the 1%. It is a party that accepts no new taxes, no closing of loopholes, no crackdowns on overseas tax havens, and no increase in corporate tax rates, even as the biggest corporations pay little or no taxes on billions in profits. We'll come back to that. In the 1950s, the corporate sector accounted for an average of 27.6% of all federal revenues. In 2010, it had dropped to about a third of that, 8.9%. And individual tax rates for the richest are now lower than all but five of the past 79 years. Meanwhile, costs are continuing to uh, rise for the current wars in the Middle East and for past wars. One thing I think that's not sufficiently recognized well, here's the headline. Cost of treating veterans will rise long past wars. So whenever the Middle Eastern wars are terminated, the expense for the uh, veterans taking care of them, their medical expenses and so on, will continue to rise uh, for 30 or 40 years. What surprised me in this piece is that the, uh, this cost of the war is going to uh, continue to rise for decades to come. Any of the current wars will not lower those veterans' costs. Indeed, they will rise ever more steeply for decades to come as the population of veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan expands, ages, and becomes more infirm. To date, more than 2.2 million troops have served in those wars. Studies show that the peak years for government health care and disability compensation costs for veterans from past wars came 30 to 40 years after those wars ended. For Vietnam, that peak has not yet been reached, mm -hmm. which is staggering. Interesting, yes. Y yes, so uh, 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 back to the uh, bonus army uh, then that you uh, talked about. Mm -hmm. The expenses for these uh, wars uh, haven't reached the peak yet for Vietnam, and uh, you can imagine what lies ahead in the future for the veterans of the uh, Gulf Wars. Meanwhile, headline, corporate profits boom, jobs and wages still a bust. Uh, another headline, companies churn out profits, but not jobs. Today's uh, local newspaper, Big Oil reaps big profit in second quarter as prices soar, and uh, so on. So that's where the money goes, as we're told that uh, uh, the country is uh, poor and in debt, and we have to uh, cut expenses. And I'll stop there. Thanks, Ron. Questions or comments, David? Well. There's a lot to say about this budget issue, yep. <laughs> and it's hard to know how to say yeah, it without exactly. talking in figures. I guess if I were to say one thing to, to debunk, there's so many things that need to be debunked and rebunked uh, about <laughs> this issue. There's a lot of bunk around. Unbunked, right, right. Uh, <laughs> is that there isn't any magic number, whether it were 10 trillion or 15 trillion or 20 trillion. We're talking about large, scary numbers, but 
there isn't any difference between another trillion now and another trillion t uh, d raising the debt limit, another trillion uh, a, few a few years back or a few years forward. Um, the question becomes why, why now? Mm -hmm. Why is it a crisis now that we're moving from 14 trillion to 15 yes. trillion? Um, and clearly it's a ma ma manufactured crisis. Yes. Which is, mm -hmm. which is being done in order to cut back on social programs. I guess the only, yes. slightly, the only slightly new wrinkle on this is, is that there are some, in some of these budget plans, there are, there are a, at, at least, at least a, a, you know, assumptions being made that some of the of this saving in the future will come from the wind down of, of, our, of our wars. And even that, I think, is causing. I mean, oh, I think it's. I think it's what they're saying isn't honest, but even that may be causing some conflict, w w sort of with as a kind of subplot within this, this larger, um, this larger effort, which is primarily to begin the process on which social programs like Medicare and Social Security will be will be rolled back. Um, comment, Ron. <clears throat> uh, no, uh, I think many people are simply not aware of uh, where, the, where the money is going and uh, how it's being paid for, this massive transfer of wealth that's going on uh, between uh, the uh, middle class and the, uh, exactly. the big rich, uh, which has been a uh, notably successful uh, class war. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, those who are waging it are accusing others of... Uh, waging class war because they've noticed this and talked about it. So, uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, part of the uh, melodrama are uh, drama queens in, or kings in Washington who are making a big point of this at the present time because they see it as a way of gaining partisan advantage. The big strategy seems to be to make an enormous hullabaloo about this, hang it around Obama's neck, and then def use it to defeat him in the election next year. I certainly think Obama should be defeated in the election next year, you know, as a rejection yeah. of the policies yeah. that he's been yeah. following. But it would be clear that, that this, um, uh, the, the, the actors in this notably successful class war are, uh, the list begins, the dramatis personae begins with the President of the United States. Uh, what, what, what is, uh, uh, David's quite right to speak of a manufactured crisis to cut back on social programs, that's a crucial point. But the crisis is manufactured as much by the White House, indeed more by the White House than by the Tea Partiers or the uh, seriously out of his depths, depth, Mr. Boehner. Um, the, uh, it's the White House that's doing this, uh, and uh, it is doing it precisely in order to cut those social programs. Uh, the remarkable uh, uh, d uh, report by the Congressional Budget Office two weeks ago uh, pointing out that if Congress does absolutely nothing, that is nothing in regard to the debt and the uh, uh, the deficit and the debt uh, the deficit and the debt in the way that's uh, been presented as such a great crisis. The deficit disappears at the end of the next presidential term. Now, the Congressional Budget Office is not in the business of making wild-eyed and fantastic predictions. Uh, their, their predictions are conservative, their, con their, their predictions are based on the solid information uh, that's available. They're supposed to be nonpartisan. But here they came up with a really nonpartisan point. They pointed out that this thing was all theater. Uh, kabuki theater, as a friend of mine says, which is probably a... Uh, 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 an unfair reference to uh, the, uh, a theatrical tradition. Uh, all, but uh, the important point is that this is a manufactured pr crisis, as David said, and the White House is doing it. Look, the White House could have said at any point, um, uh, hey, uh, stop all this folder roll. Uh, the 14th Amendment makes clear that the debts of the United States have got to be honored. The debts are the ones that Congress has taken on uh, by uh, its various enactments, and I, as President, intend, intend simply to act in accord with those debts. Um, uh, same thing happened in the Truman administration, administration, interestingly enough, although that precedent hasn't been much talked about. Uh, and then all the talk about the debt ceiling which itself is a fairly recent uh, innovation. I mean, uh, it goes back to the First World War. Um, the, uh, uh, 
uh, would, would simply go away. Uh, uh, President Obama has shown himself remarkably unconstrained by constitutional limitations on the presidency. Look at all those dead people in Libya. Remember, he doesn't have any constitutional authority to kill people in Libya, and there are a lot of dead folks. Uh, so uh, he hasn't been particularly worried about that. But suddenly to say, oh my goodness, oh my gracious, I can't possibly violate the uh, debt limit, even though it's been done before, and even though the case for the presidency to do, the, for, for the executive to do that is stronger than for the executive to go to war by itself. Why not? Why doesn't he do this? The answer is that he wants to be sure that he's part of a program that cuts back on social programs. Uh, when the Obama administration came into office, they faced a serious financial crisis. There was an obvious solution, a jobs program, something like the WPA from the, uh, uh, fr from the New Deal. Uh, they chose specifically not to do that. People were a little c uh, surprised at the time. But it was clear that Obama was working for the people that he's been working for all along, the 1%. And that the job was to oppose austerity in this country. The Kabuki theater had to do with who's going to get blamed for imposing austerity. And the White House has not been particularly adept at making sure the blame gets placed on their opponents, but they've done a pretty good job on the whole. And particularly after last night, about last night, uh, it looks like they're going to succeed. But the point is to see that the, 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 it was the whole crisis was avoidable by the White House, except that they wanted to impose austerity. And they wanted to be part of, of, of a system. They, they wanted to be sure that austerity was imposed and that the, uh, 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 and then I got blamed for it. So far, it's, it's looking pretty good. So, Carl, your idea is that uh, uh, the White House uh, instigated and participated in this uh, supposed debt crisis uh, without realizing that it was going to be the albatross that the other party would try to hang around his neck and uh, def use it to defeat him in the next election? You think uh, the... Uh, you know, Ron, you're usually the one who complains when I start th th talking about what the motive of the White House is doing. Right. I'm, I'm less interested in the motives, what yeah. they saw. As I say, I'm, it's not clear to me whether there is a, uh, 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 you know, how conscious, if you like, this program was all along. Did the White House set a trap for the Tea Partiers and uh, the Republicans? Well, I don't know. Uh, but it's pretty clear what their policy was, and they don't blunder around from policy to policy by accident. They choose policies for reasons, and the reasons here are fairly, you usually figure out those reasons when you ask the historian's question, cui bono, whose interests are being served? Uh, and if we ask whose interests are being served by what the White House did, it's pretty clear. I, I would I would refer to Paul Krugman's column this morning in the New York Times. Um, usually I'm not critical of Krugman because whatever truth is to be found <laughs> in, the New York uh, Times. in the New York Times is most likely to be found there. Yeah. But I think he, he gets it wrong when he defends the notion that there is a real difference between the Democratic and Republican parties on this issue or that and, – and it's kind of – the column was in, inter, interesting for two reasons. One, it's clear that he's challenging his colleague Thomas Friedman yep. and the notion of this radical centrism that that the the idiotic Friedman has come up with recently. <laughs> yes. But but beyond You're being that, too kind. But other than yeah, that, right? Yeah. <laughs> but beyond that, what Krugman is saying is usually is is not uh, you know again I don't I don't I wouldn't usually consider it. Uh, uh, worthy to sort of nitpick with what I don't agree about what Krugman says, but in this point, I think it's a kind of major, major point that he doesn't get that the Democrats and Republicans are basically maybe are not on the same page, but are on different pages in the same book mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and are reading the same book. And at the yeah. end of that book, we get to more transfer of wealth from the, from all exactly. of us from the the bottom 80 percent to the top 20 percent or fewer and we get the um the uh drawing back of major so new deal social programs i yeah. thought his main thesis was the uh, attempt of journalism to uh, equate democratic and republican uh um, mistakes uh, in uh, this regard and to uh 
I keep intimating that uh, both sides are equally guilty about this uh, concerning the supposed uh, debt crisis. I, I mean, that point of his is well, well taken, but he doesn't play it out properly. Yeah. In other words, he's assuming that there are the, 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 the usual discourse assumes that there are sort of ideological differences that separate yeah. Yeah. The, the two parties on, on this, this issue. And, um, and he's right, you know, Krugman is, Krugman is right in, in saying uh, th that they're not both equally at, f at fault or that, that, that they're not sort of morally, morally the same but he's not, he's not extending the argument to the point where he's understanding how they really are the same. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. you know. The, the, there's, uh, it's, uh, the New York Times op-ed page ran a piece by an Atlantic editor this week um, in which he said, well, you know, you gotta, uh, Obama's got to realize that he's sort of like Lincoln. Um, Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation as a, as a, as a compromise between the anti-slavery people and the pro-slavery people. Um, and, uh, but Lincoln always had to be aware that there was abolitionists out there. Uh, no, well, first of all, this is a nonsensical account of the, uh, uh, of the coming of the Emancipation Proclamation. I recommend, I've recommended before William Marvel's wonderful book, uh, uh, Mr. Lincoln Goes to War, which seems to me to talk about what actually was going on in the Lincoln presidency in regard to the war. Uh, but the point here is not so much uh, to correct the account of the 1860s, but to correct the account of the Obama administration, because this editor wants to suggest that Obama should compromise without forgetting uh, his left wing, you know, those people who were saying. And, and that's simply backwards, that's simply upside down. It's not compromise that's at stake here. Um, what uh, Obama is doing is, pro is, is what he seems to be doing, or let us begin with the notion that what Obama is doing is what he seems to be doing. Doing, that is imposing austerity and watch how that happened and we can think that that's a reasonable thing that he wants to do a because he says so and B because uh, he doesn't have to if he doesn't want to there's a way out uh, we uh, there's obviously more uh, uh, hours of harmless fun in the debt in the debt business uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, maybe we should go on David you want you want to uh, want to deal, yes, deal a hand here on to on to Norway on, on to Norway unfortunately uh, no unfortunately quite right um, I guess I wanted to make a couple of points and hopefully that will be a little different than what is what the major discourse in the media in the mainstream media and maybe even in the in the non mainstream media I guess one thing I like to say to start to start with is that um, for whatever reason, I I still feel that in the case of uh, of this uh, massacre in Norway, that the issue of mental path path you know pathology should be talked about. It should be factored in. That it yes. shouldn't be become um, it, even in the in the in, 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 in interest of understanding this in political context, in the in the interest of of understanding human acts as not lone wolves and as being influenced by social forces, which is a good thing and, and what m most of my comments w will will be about. Um, it it deserves to be said mainly because I'm I'm not seeing it said, except in in sort of the wrong way that there has to be something fundamentally um, um, awry about someone who you know, you know, you know, commits acts like, like this, and that may have to do just with him. You know. the, I guess beyond that is the more, is the p political context, which of course is what most of the discourse is, is about. And as usual, I'll, I'll say you know some of the same things that I usually say when something like this is happen, happening. I guess uh, we all have our our hobby horses, and I just think my hobby horse is a really is a really good and true hobby horse. <laughs> is that is that um, what I what I wait for when something like this happens is is for commentators to to avoid implicating that Islamophobic discourse which is intimately t tied to U.S. relationships with our major ally in the Middle East, namely, namely is, is, is Israel, 
and all of the rhetoric and all of the Islamophobia that is inherent in the neoconservative and Zionist discourse over the last 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, we can go back and go over th all the whole business from Bernard Lewis to Samuel Huntington to Daniel Pipes to all the people that are currently David Horowitz, Pamela, Pamela Geller that have been referred to. But my main beef, um, and it's a, it's a, it's a perhaps it, it isn't with the mainstream media so much, but as with some of what I call, uh, of what I call the anti-hate people in the in the anti-hate biz, who I think in a way should should know better, but tend to focus on right-wing fringe groups. Um, I'm talking about here like the Southern Poverty Law Center the Anti-Defamation -Def 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 League and, the, uh, and an organization called uh, PRA, Political Re Research, Research Asso Associates, whose main re re representative in these matters is a man named Chip, Chip Burlett, who one will see referred to on the, the sort of left, leftist, liberal left websites about these matters. Um, I believe that, it, that the more the more central part of this narrative in relation to understanding the context of this man's actions has to do with Islamophobia in the uh, neoconservative Zionist context rather than Islamophobia in the paleoconservative context. Uh, a lot has been made out of uh, the writing of William S. Lind, mm. whose work it can be found in the past on the counterpunch on the left wing counterpunch website, and a lot's being made out of this right now, and uh, it's worth talking about. But I think it's a mis, it's a a mis misdirected ar 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 argument that's that's being made to to avoid what um, the central the central point that ought to be made is that. Um, this this man's actions need to be seen in the context of not just Islamophobia, and but the global war on t terror as 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 it has been fought for ten years or twenty years or thirty years, and I think I think Carl I think you made the right point. I mean, maybe you were quoting somebody else that the the difference between retail terror and right. wholesale terror, mm -hmm. and that's what it, it, the retail terror ought to be understood in the context of wholesale wholesale terror terror and um, and the the point of avoiding the the neoconservative Zionist context for this I think avoids um, ascribe placing this man's actions in ways that lead us to understanding the centers of power and I think that's the fundamental point I, I'd like to make that there is something to do not just with this man as a fringe actor even though I again would stress the the, the mental mental pathology of someone who would do this, especially a, a privileged person who would do this. But again, if we want to go, if we want to do politics, let's do politics in a way that leads us to the centers of power, not not from them. Yeah. Thank you, David. Uh, I should remind you that you are watching uh, News from Neptune, uh, brought to you at this time each week by Urbana Public Television, Carl Osterbrook, David Green, and Ron Zoke, talking about the news of the week and its coverage by the media. And I want to ask David about his uh, notion, notion he started with, mm -hmm. that there's something fundamentally wrong with someone who commits acts like this. He's referring to the murders in, mm -hmm. in Norway. Um, and uh, also the distinction between retail terrorism, that is terrorism by an individual here, and wholesale terrorism, terrorism by a state or organized group. Um, and uh, it seems to me that David's point is exactly right, but there's the danger that it proves too much, that there's something fundamentally wrong with someone who commits acts like this. A week ago when uh, the Norway murders were taking place, uh, the American executive res was responsible for murders from North Africa to the Indian subcontinent from the Horn of Africa to Central Asia um, and uh, included in many cases uh, children uh, younger than those who were murdered in Norway uh, 
indiscriminate, and the total number of people killed, just take that week, the total number of people killed by uh, the American executive in that time was, of course, a number far greater than the 77 or 78 people who seem to have died in Norway. Something fundamentally wrong with these people, David? Yeah. Um. Yeah, and I, I sort of, I sort of an, 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 an anticipate that 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 question, even though I don't really have an answer for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been thinking about it in terms of, uh, you know, you can go back to Adolf Adolf Eich, Eich, Eichmann and and talk about uh, it was never considered uh, during the Eichmann trial that there was some there was a a mental pathology there. Maybe we weren't there yet in mm -hmm. in talking about and psychologizing things quite that way, but the question of evil came up, mm -hmm. okay, and the question, of course, as everyone knows, in Hannah Arendt's famous, famous book on the topic, the, the, the so-called so so -called banality of e e evil. I think that that, that that thread of that discourse can lead to an understanding of the, the mental aspect of what's going on with people who, who do what they do because they feel like the state is supporting them in those actions. And I don't know how we talk about that in the context of state actions versus the context of someone of a quote unquote lone lone wolf. Yeah. So maybe instead of, of downgrading mental the, the <coughs> mental aspect of it in relationship to to uh, Mr. Bre Mr. Bre Brevik, we should upgrade it into in relationship to the people who who controls state power? Here, here. Yeah. Questions or comments, uh, Ron? Today, I assume you've seen the bumper sticker that says, uh, "War is terrorism with a bigger budget." Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, is there something uh, that becomes qualitatively uh, different uh, as we change the scale of uh, what's going on, from uh, uh, murdering uh, dozens to mm -hmm. murdering uh, thousands? That's an interesting question, but. Uh, the transformation of uh, quantity into quality. When but politics have been reduced to bumper stickers, you know, <laughs> yeah, right, right. no, 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 I agree uh, with you. Yeah. In fact, I was going to suggest, uh, I, there's one on my car that makes your point, killing one person is murder, killing yeah. thousands is foreign policy. Right, right. Um, exa look, I mean, these are, 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 are fundamentals that uh, uh, we are, that are uh, political scientists and pundits uh, are in the business of obfuscating. Yeah. They're obvious. Yeah, uh, uh, minor note, uh, apparently in this 1,500-page so-called manifesto that the Oslo killer uh, wrote, uh, he quotes explicitly Pamela Geller and some of the other people you mentioned, mm -hmm. the American uh, right-wingers who are engaging in anti-Islamic uh, agitation. And uh, uh, another minor aspect of it is, the, to me, the similarity to some of the things said by the Unabomber, uh, Ted Kaczynski, who, who was, too, who was eh? also uh, yeah. extensively quoted uh, in this uh, work. Uh, but uh, one uh, aspect of it is that Kaczynski said that uh, uh, essentially that uh, he was being ignored and in order to get uh, people to pay any attention to, them, to him, uh, he had to start killing people. And that was his way of marketing ideas. And, and uh, uh, Bravik picks up this same theme, that he's marketing uh, Islamophobia, essentially, uh, by uh, killing off the people who are soft on uh, Islam and so on. And uh, uh, that's one way to get people to pay attention to your ideas, however crazy those ideas may be. But anyway, uh, uh, it'd be nice to... Uh, for someone to pay attention to me and my ideas, but I have no uh, intention of killing anyone to bring that about. <laughs> I never, uh, I never knew Kaczynski, the Unabomber, but he lived in the building next to me. Uh -huh. uh, uh, he was a classmate and uh -huh. lived in the next dormitory, basically, uh, for a couple of years. I'm sure I passed him on the way in and out of the, you know, the quad any number of times. And uh, we had, uh, there were mutual friends or people I know, classmates of mine, friends from those days who knew him. So uh, yeah, hey, that's uh, it's uh, all around us, perhaps. Huh? And uh, also, when you were at Harvard, there was a character there named D D Daniel Pipes. Yes. Uh, Oh, yeah. who, who you may who you may have known, oh, yes. and uh -huh. um, and I've always wondered, and you know, again, this is know. this is my hobby horse to a certain extent. But the the thing that fascinates me about Daniel Pipes is that 
he he is clearly has pathologies going on. He's clearly ought to be seen as a kind of lunatic fringe. But I've always felt that because of his association, because of his Jew Jewishness and his association with his Israel and Zionism, that he's given a certain pass in the lunatic fringe mm -hmm. department. Not by not by everyone, but in a way that, and because of his ac academic background, his Harvard background and his Middle Eastern studies background and his claims to uh, have a scholarly grasp of, of some of these issues. Um, I felt that um, people like him, as well as people like Samuel Huntington and Bernard Lewis, mm -hmm. have um, served to make, uh, make, you know, as 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 much fun as it is to look at people like Pamela Geller and and so forth. I, I would focus on those people who make these ideas respectable. Mm -hmm. And I certainly think over the, over over the years, people like Daniel Pipes and. Um, I, I wouldn't say that the same. There's a, a woman who who is sort of in the same category named Phyllis Chesler, uh, mm -hmm. who uh, or or Alan Dur Dur Dershowitz. I mean, whichever of these people, there 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 aren't any <laughs> there aren't any clear uh, lines drawn between what you hear Dershowitz saying and what you hear um, what you hear is uh, people that are that are more common, commonly named is Islamophobes are saying. Yeah, this uh, there the the intellectual tradition here is uh, uh, <laughs> has a lot to answer for. Uh, Chomsky himself used to make fun of Samuel Huntington's uh, appointment as professor of the science of government at Harvard. Uh, for Chomsky, it was outrageous to say, speak of a science of government, particularly when the result was the essentially ideological constructs that Samuel Huntington was responsible for, the most notable one being the clash of civilizations lie that yeah. underlies a good bit yeah. of this uh, Islamophobic talk. Yeah, I'm re reminded of the old controversy that broke out in the York Review of Books when the mathematician Sergei Lang uh, started disputing the uh, pseudo-scientific stuff that Huntington was putting out, writing complicated mathematical uh, formulas that essentially uh, meant nothing whatever. They were total nonsense. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, but. Uh, but uh, Lang was a difficult guy to deal with sometimes. But uh, what he said there was right on, I think, in many cases. It might be worthwhile mentioning, too, that Michael Lind, uh, who mentioned a moment ago, is someone uh, uh, quoted here. Um, uh, the, other, the other, you've got the wrong Lind. What did I say? Michael Lind. It's okay. the other Lind, right? The William, other Lind. William S. Lind? <laughs> William, 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 William Lind. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> Uh, no, the other was, thing about American little scientists is they all have the same last names. You, yeah. know. <laughs> you, gotta, you, you can't tell your players without a program. Yeah. Uh, Lin's concept of fourth generation war is the thing that I think that uh, the Oslo killer was particularly interested in, which has to do with the, uh, uh, which feeds into the Islamophobic uh, uh, line, uh, that is the war between uh, states. Uh, and uh, interest groups, <laughs> not to put yeah. no finer point on it, guerrilla groups and whatnot, um, the uh, sort of thing that brought, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Christopher Hitchens into the, uh, uh, into the Islamophobic camp uh, after 9-11. Um, there, I heard an interesting thing, too, this morning. The argument of a group of atheists are suing uh, the... Uh, people are putting up the structures in the World Trade Center space in in uh, New York that they are including this found cross uh, on that, and these a the atheist group is suing on the grounds that this is an establishment of religion contrary to the Constitution. Uh, but of course, the uh, NPR busily quoted the people who were saying, "Oh no, this is a tribute to the families and the people who died and all this sort of stuff." And by, because, because after all, it was radical uh, ra radical Muslims who killed them. So the point is <laughs> that that yeah, the uh, is Islamophobic line of uh, the interpretation of 9/11 and of the following wars uh, is, however uncomfortable, there for the American government to use. It's uncomfortable, I say, because obviously in its wars in the Middle East, a principal ally of the United States is the l l leading conservative uh, Islamic State, Saudi Arabia, which has just sent more troops in to suppress uh, the popular uprising in Bahrain, a uh, popular u uprising that is at least as um, democratically based as the uprising in Libya, and probably a good deal more so. Uh, but that's one uh, we're not helping. Uh, in fact, we're doing just the opposite, because an awful lot of those Saudi weapons come from the United States.
Is there a useful distinction between the uh, extreme, uh, or you might call uh, nutty right-wingers, and those who try to put an intellectual face on uh, what they're saying, such as Pipes and uh, um, George Will and uh, um, uh, Krauthammer, I'm and so on. on. Uh, yeah, the other, the en end of this is uh, Glenn Beck and some others who are hinting that uh, those young people on the island there were leftists. Uh, they remind him of the uh, Hitler Youth and mm -hmm. uh, hinting again that they deserve to be killed. And uh, of course, he would never say that explicitly, but uh, that's, that's the um, general tenor of uh, what they're saying. But I would, I would, yeah, I would say just, just to add on to that, none of, I mean, this whole conversation, I, I guess, always requires a sort of disclaimer because, no, you know, I would never argue that ideas cause people to do things in a quite literal sense or quite concrete sense. Or, and I would, I would defend anybody's right to say what they have to say without being held um, um, responsible for mentally unbalanced people who, who act, who, who say that they're acting on those, on those beliefs in, in doing what, what, what they do. Um, I, I, I wouldn't, I mean, there's just a lot of pitfalls in talking about this, this yeah. topic, but I, I would like to make that clear. It's just that, again, you get back to, he did behave in a political context, yes. and you need that context right. without necessarily blaming somebody for saying something, even the people who, even the people who I've been saying throughout are saying things that are, are need to be need to be commented on. And I think this is an important point you're suggesting, David. There have been calls already, uh, more in Europe than in this country, but even in this country, to yeah. shut down some of these hate sites, you know, because yeah. of so forth and so on. Yeah. Um, uh, we've heard all this before, and in fact, it points up something we forget every now and then, that we have much stronger traditions of free speech in this country than most European states do, even even the Scandinavian ones. Uh, there, The calls were quicker there to make sure that this sort of talk uh, is, not, uh, is not allowed. Uh, you know, and that is, for reasons you suggest, uh, important to uh, important to know. Yeah, what's appalling to me is in uh, Europe, some places, it's uh, a criminal offense to raise doubts about the Holocaust. That's right. Uh, That's what you're right. Yes, I mean, uh, you know, the, the famous Farasan case that uh, Chomsky was involved in years and years ago, uh, Farasan was prosecuted by the French government for falsifying history. Now, uh, I must admit, a lot of historians of my acquaintance would be in serious danger of the law, certain yeah. jeopardy. Yeah. If, uh, yeah. that take, law take, be... take the drug dealers out of prison and put the historians <laughs> put in. Put the historians <laughs> in for falsification, yes. Actually, now that we've... Well, uh, let's, uh, I, we have only a few minutes minutes left, I would like to uh, uh, fall back on a, uh, a bromide. When you get to be my age, you know, there's a tendency always to uh, uh, sum, sum, what, sum up what one has learned in a long life uh, in terms of bromides. My kids make immense fun of it. Uh, but I have said for a long time uh, things like, a moment ago, uh, nobody can be wrong all the time, and uh, uh, the poets often get there first. Uh, in terms of describing the world that we live in, and I'm using the word poets uh, almost in Shakespeare's sense, that is, people who write imaginative literature of every sort of plays, you know, so forth, even movies today. I have a particular poet in mind, the scriptwriter for the movie The Town, uh, which was uh, referred to in the news this week. Uh, the movie uh, stars Ben Affleck and Jeremy Renner. Uh, Affleck is okay, Renner is out of sight. He's an amazing actor. Um, and the uh, movie was written by one Aaron Stockard, who happens to be my nephew. Uh, and, uh, but I'm not mentioning it because to do a commercial for Aaron, but because the Republican Party uh, is mentioning it this week. House Majority Whip Kevin McCarthy, uh, the uh, how, the House, the vote counter for the Republicans in the House, began his talk to trying to get to the Tea Party people they were trying to get to vote for Boehner's bill by showing a clip from the movie The Town, that Aaron wrote, trying to forge a sense of unity among the independent minded caucus. Uh, Ben Affleck, uh, as Doug McRae, comes into a room where his friend, these two guys, two bank robbers from South Boston, hence the Boston connection. Um, and they get the accents right, better than I can do too, I might say. Uh, Affleck uh, says uh, to Renner, I need your help. 
I can't tell you what it is. You can never ask me about it later, and we're going to hurt some people. And an amazing turn, Renner does a very slight double take and turns to Affleck and says, whose car are we taking? Yeah. Uh, very good. But the interesting thing for our purposes is that the Republicans thought this was the way to rally support to hurt some people in the House. <laughs> that is, that they were going to get together you know, essentially thugs um, to go after, uh, to, to, <laughs> to, to support uh, uh, Speaker Boehner's bill. The Boehner's statement, endlessly quoted in the press, was telling the rest of the Republicans to get their ass in line. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 I mean, and, and uh, the, the film is a film about bank robbers and the bank robbers of the center. Uh, the film is so well written, uh, full disclosure once again, is so well written that the, um, uh, the, 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 the satirical frame you know, uh, was missed entirely by the Republicans. Mm -hmm. And so they make uh, heroes of bankruptcy. It picked up, of course, by other poets. John Stewart made much of this in his, um, uh, in, in his account. And this is a, uh, a tradition that goes back to the 18th century poet who wrote, satire should, like a polished razor keen, wound with a touch that's scarcely felt or seen. <laughs> but certainly wasn't felt or seen by the Republicans when yeah. they used these, the, these, uh, these thugs uh, conversation as the basis for uh, the thuggish action that they were planning in the House. It's remarkable. Again. And as usual, with stories like this, I always say the question, you want to ask, how did that story get in the media? Uh, where did that story come from? Who made sure that we know about it? Yeah. Well. Uh, it appeared in something called Talking's po Talking Points Memo, which is a wonkish uh, uh, political site. Uh, but they ascribe the release of the story that House aides leaked the story to the Washington Post. House aides is an interesting w word. I mean, it could be any number of people in the house. Okay, who's doing what to whom here, you know, and whose car are we going to take? Uh, it seems to me that that's what we, should, what we should ask about in part in this and leave open the, the point that I started with, that the, that the whole thing is a drama, it's a show, uh, it's a play, and the White House are merely players. Uh, the way to, merely in the Shakespeare sense of simply, or players as well. Um, that uh, they're involved in this thing from the beginning in this uh, uh, charade that it's necessary to uh, cut social programs uh, and, uh, you know, as Abby Hoffman once said, God is dead and we did it for the kids. Uh, <laughs> we've, got to, we've got to kill the federal government here. And, and that it seems to me that while the Republicans are pre pretending to be thugs, uh, from a well-written movie, uh, the White House are actually being thugs by making sure that the austerity program goes down, uh, that the austerity program goes into effect. Comments, well, Sheldon? Well, let me just say, raise, raise an issue, a you know, related issue, because I know Ron talked about the New York Times article this morning that shows the recent economic data that shows that actually the GDP hasn't grown since 2007. And, um, you know, you raise the word, us, you, you invoke the word us, us, austerity, which has been very much a part of this debate. And in some of the writing that I've tried to do recently, which has appeared in the local newspaper, I've, I've tried to make the argument that, which isn't, isn't hard to make, that as we've become a much richer country, that is, as GDP has gone up, um, that all of the benefits of that of that increased productivity and increased output have gone to the upper 20 percent, right. most of it to the upper 10 percent, and really incredible amounts of it just to the upper 1 percent. Yep. And on the other hand, I'm a little uncomfortable with this. I, I want people to understand that they're not getting their fair share. But I don't want to peep, I, I also don't want people to feel like I worship the notion of GDP or growing GDP, yeah. or that I feel that there's something not problematic about the way we talk about GDP because there's so much in there that isn't of value to people. And, and so the fact, it, it isn't just the fact, you know, the, the current problem is based on the fact partly that the GDP hasn't grown or is back to where it was four years ago, which is historically something that hasn't happened probably in quite some time. but 
the problem is that um, that we uh, that is that the the the, the wrong people we're, we are a rich country, but more importantly, the wrong people have have the money. Well, and I, I actually that point that you raised, David, is a good one, and it seems to me that that these very reasonable environmental and ecological concerns that have been raised in, each, in recent years should make us worried about this whole point of production. You know that growth is naturally good, yeah. uh, but still, and all, remember the cure for this is uh, democratic control of production, yes. uh, changing production production for use, not for profit. Now things are produced only if it will make some rich people richer. Uh, not whether it will make the lives of anyone any better or not. And that simply has got to change. We saw a specific example of that in the, um, uh, in the bailout of uh, General Motors. Uh, the government, the Obama administration, was in a position here uh, to take control of a major industrial concern and uh, in an area where a great deal of change is necessary. We've got to move away from private automobiles, as everyone admits, uh, to mass transit of one form or another, from light rail vehicles to subways to various and to, to, to uh, interurban railroads, to things that really can move people in a way that is not so remarkably destructive of people and the environment as the individual automobile is. The automobile is over. Uh, and uh, you know, the fact that the Chinese are uh, buying more of them than other people, uh, even per capita, uh, should worry us. Uh, but the administration chose not to do that. They chose not to turn General Motors into a, um, uh, a company that produced for use rather than for profit. They turned it back to the hands of the same people who had it all along and the same form of production. Now that's what's wrong. And why did they do that? Well, they did it in part because there was no democratic control on it saying, you know, you can't run this for the benefit of the few. You've got to run this for the benefit of the many. Uh, and, uh, you know, so why, why should we be surprised? Uh, that's what's necessary. Why uh, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, and, and remember, too, that while we talk about rise of GDP, we also have, at the same time, rising with that GDP, in fact, the curve is sharper, inequality is rising in this country. Yes, yes. Uh, the U.S. is now uh, the most unequal of the developed economies. Uh, I'm, we mentioned this last week that uh, we used to be uh, uh, we, 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 we used to be second to the Australians on that because the Australians ran in the Aborigines. Uh, we've uh, overcome that uh, particular handicap. You've been watching news from Neptune on UPTV for the 30th week of 2011. Our program is named in honor of Noam Chomsky. This has been the Town Edition, and the towns of Boston and Washington were at, were at stake. If you're interested in our program, you might also like the White House Chronicle Sundays at seven. Democracy now weekdays at eight. The big picture with Tom Hart. Sorry, weekdays at seven. The big picture with Tom Hartman weekdays at eight. Labor's World View Sundays at four. The David Pakman Show Saturdays at seven. Essential Descent on Sunday at two. Populist Dialogues Thursday at one thirty. I'm Carl Estabrook. My discussions tonight on News from Neptune have been Ron Gold and David Green. This and other editions of this program can be seen on the website newsfromneptune.com and on Facebook. I can be reached at Carl at newsfromneptune.com and on Facebook. I'm happy to receive your comments. My thanks to our director, Jason Lakin. Inshallah, we'll be back next week with a new edition of News from Neptune. In the meantime, confusion to our enemies and a good night to you. <laughs>